All right, very good. Now, how much time do I have? Because whenever I speak, I need to stop watch. Because even though time is infinite, our time is not. So, so how much time do I have, Councilman Watley or Pastor? Let me know. Uh, pastor can let you know. How much time do I have? We we'll cut off at eight o'clock. Cut off at eight o'clock. Okay, that's good. All right, so I'll do about a half hour or so. I have some information that I added into this presentation today because I've already seen episode five, uh, which is called Rise from 1940 to 1968. All right, so. Um, this presentation, this is a short presentation here, it's called Breaking the Chains, How Black History Month and Black Panther Reconnects Us to Our History and Culture Exposed to the Best. So one of the things I deal with are the origins of uh, African American History Month, which is called Black History Month, because a lot of you know we celebrate every February, a lot of us don't know the history uh, of the monthly cultural celebration, right? First of all, I'll do, I'll take a couple of questions and then this presentation will answer some of your questions and go deeper into some of the topics that were we'll talked about uh, in episode five of the African American Community Cross. And I'll give some of the information that was left out as well. So let's take one or two questions, if there are any, from what you saw, uh, from what you just saw. How many people have seen that episode before? <coughs> You've seen that episode? Okay. All right. Uh, any questions before I get started? None? Okay. All right, so uh, this is a uh, this is the full three-hour presentation I have dealing with this topic, breaking the change while we celebrate African American History Month, exposing the myths. And I deal with a lot of history. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who created Negro History Week in 1926, and dispelled myths about our history. Also, this presentation once again is dedicated to uh, Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. Malcolm X was talked about in uh, episode five, and Muhammad Ali was left out. I'm not exactly sure why. I know they only had an hour to deal with it but they left Muhammad Ali out. Um, but uh, Muhammad Ali became heavyweight champion of the world February 25th, 1964. Did they talk about Ali? They showed him. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. All right, that's what I thought. Okay. He became heavyweight champion of the world February 24th, 1964. At the time, the youngest heavyweight champion, 22 years old. You know, Mike Tyson broke that record. He became heavyweight champion at age 20. But these two were good friends until Malcolm uh, leaves the Nation of Islam. He officially separates from the Nation of Islam on uh, March 8, 1964. We know that Malcolm is going to join the civil rights movement when he leaves the nation of Islam. So this is this is something that's left out of uh, many rivers of the cross also. They also didn't deal with Malcolm's assassination. But February 21st, 1965, uh, which the anniversary would be this Thursday, uh, we know Malcolm was assassinated at the Audubon Ballroom. Okay, so this presentation is uh, dedicated to memory of these two. Uh, all right, I'm on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Sundays, 9 p.m. 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This past Sunday, they re-aired old shows of all the nighttime shows because the snowstorm hit it. So they called and said, look, you, can, uh, you don't have to come in. So I said, because it's being I just gotten off of the road, doing a lecture at uh, St. Francis Missionary Baptist Church on Warren, and it was getting worse. The weather, I said, okay, you can just play last week's episode. But visit my website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can listen to podcasts on my shows also, all right? And some of the things I do within this presentation, we do with the origins of African American History Month, or Black History Month, why it was created, what we need to do to make it relevant for the day and the future. Because instead of just recycling the same 15 to 20 sanitized Negroes every year, each year there's a theme. So it has to be a purpose when we do this, okay? And dispel myths regarding our history. Now, anytime I speak, I normally say some things that are outside the circumference of your own awareness. Just because you never heard them before or disagree with them or don't like them does not mean that they're not true. This means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. I may be dealing with something that's outside the circumference of your own awareness. So when we talk about African American History Month, when we talk about uh, getting a better understanding of our history and who we are, all right, here's uh, about a 59-second clip of Malcolm X asking the question of who are you, which helps us to better understand why African American History Month is so important. Okay, let's look at this. <laughs> Yeah. 
questions that really makes you think. Who's seen that before? A couple of people. Okay, so very quickly, let's get a couple of comments uh, on this because this ties right into African American history while reconnecting us to our history and culture. What do you think about that? You're shocked. You're speechless. <laughs> <laughs> but he asked, a, he asked a very important question. What happened to your name? What happened to your history? He said, he said, he said, he said, what, he said, what was your name? Don't tell me Smith, Jones, Bunch, or Powell. They didn't have those type of names where you and I came from. He said, what happened to your land? What happened to your language? What happened to your culture? So, he, so he's asking the question of the programming and what was taken away from us. If it did not have value, they would not have gone through the trouble to take it away from us. Okay? Did I see a hand? Yeah. Okay, let's continue. All right, now, how many people are familiar with Dr. David M. Hotel? Dr. David M. Hotel wrote a groundbreaking book, came out in 2011. Called the First Americans for Africans Documented Evidence. Uh, this is his website, historictruth.info, historictruth.info. His book has 713 footnotes fairly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago, and in South America going back at least 56,000 years ago. All right, he's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him, I think, 11 or 13 times now. If you visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, you can listen to the audio podcast of interviews I've done with them. We have uh, a couple, two or three of those interviews on YouTube as well. But on page 14 uh, of his book, uh, he lays out evidence found in Allendale County, South Carolina in uh, 2004, uh, discovered by Dr. Albert Goodyear. Now, Dr. Albert Goodyear is an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina, okay? And uh, they found 13 different types of evidence fairly documented in African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. Now, this, is, now this should not... Um, surprise us because we, we have gone all around the world anyway, and, what, and many people know this, okay, but the African presence in this country going back tens of thousands of years ago is not talked about a lot. We, we were told that we first came here August 20, 1619 uh, in Jamestown, Virginia, and even though that did happen uh, on the two uh, English pirate ships, the White Lion and the Treasure, even, that, even though that did happen, we were here going back tens of thousands of years before that, and even if you just look at the Spanish, the Spanish were involved in the transatlantic slave trade before the English. This is why when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, not only do we have to deal with it chronologically, we have to deal with the previous six, seven, eight hundred years of history prior to that and deal with the uh, Africans known as the Moors going all throughout Europe, which leads to the transatlantic slave trade happening. So the Spanish were taking Africans to the territory we call South Carolina in the 1520s, specifically 1526. This is, this is about 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia, August 20, 1619. But here's, here's what they found in Allendale County, South Carolina. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints, and lava, genetic M174D halfway group dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures, and tools. 13 different disciplines, fairly documented in African presence in this country, going back at least 51,700 years ago. When you read his book, this, these were the Khoisan. The Khoisan had the oldest DNA on the planet. They come from southern Africa. They go all around the world. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. The Twa are derisively or negatively called pigs in European anthropology and archaeology. Here's a, a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. This is an article from ScienceDaily.com called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. This article is from November 18, 2004. This is from 15 years ago. All right. And here's a so ScienceDaily.com is a scientific website. They have scientific studies, discoveries, archaeological discoveries, things like that. So here's a synopsis of uh, what this article is about. Uh, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains while artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age, all right? So this type of information is suppressed, and we're constantly told that we first came to this country conquered by European shackled and, cha and chains. Some people mistakenly think that Christopher Columbus came to this land and called the United States of America, which is not true. If you, if you actually look at where he goes on his four voyages, started August 3rd, 1492, when he set sail on the Nina Defense of Santa Maria. He goes into the Caribbean, he goes into Central America, and he goes into South America a little bit. He never comes to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. So to understand this history and what leads to Columbus setting sail, and what brings Europe out of the Dark Ages, we have to study the 800-year uh, occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, all right? 
and they lose control of their last stronghold in Spain, uh, which was Grenada, January 2nd, 1492. A good book that goes deep into this history is called Golden Age of the War, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Serlin. And it has uh, essays from a lot of scholars, a lot of our scholars dealing with the history of the Moors and what the Moors introduced into Europe and how they bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. And they're taking the teachings from ancient Egypt into Europe. If you read Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James, uh, Greek philosophy is stolen, uh, ancient Egyptian philosophy by George G.M. James. He talks about how the Moors were the custodians of the ancient Egyptian mystery system. They're the, they're the custodians of these teachings coming out of ancient Kenya. Kenya meaning the land of the blacks, one of the original names for Egypt. And they're taking this into Europe, and it's going to be this information that brings Europe out of the Dark Ages. If we look, they talk about 1943, the 1943 race riot, which is a huge race riot in this country during World War II. If we, if we look a little deeper at the 1943 race riot, because a lot of people talk about the 67 rebellion, but don't talk about the 1943 race riot, right? And that was a result of the Great Migration Wars. Okay, African Americans migrating out of the South, going up north, a lot of them coming into Detroit. And during the uh, 1940s, Detroit was the arsenal of democracy because uh, the, the, the auto plants largely had switched over from making uh, automobiles to switch to making uh, military equipment. Okay, so a lot of jobs opened up for African Americans in the Defense Department. So if we just briefly look at some of these things, right, contrary to popular belief, Mayor uh, Coleman Alexander Young did not run white people out of Detroit. They were already fleeing Detroit before he, he uh, took the oath of office in January 1974. By August of 1967, Detroit had lost over 300,000 residents and over 140,000 manufacturing, manufacturing jobs. Detroit was already going downhill in, before the rebellion. Now, now this is August 67 is after the rebellion, but before the rebellion, Detroit was already going downhill. The population of Detroit quintuples from 1900 to 1930, from 265,000 to over 1.5 million. 1930-1950, nearly 200,000 uh, African Americans uh, moved into Detroit from 1930-1950. From um, by about 1930, you had from 33 to 43, the, the population of African Americans goes from 100,000 in 1933 to 200,000 in 1943, when the, when the race riot takes place in 1943, uh, uh, June 20th, uh, 1943, in Detroit. Now, Detroit had immigrants coming from all over the world to work in the auto plant. You had Lithuanians, Hungarians, Jews, Scots, Irish, Mexicans, uh, Canadians, Lebanese, etc. We look at the Detroit race riot of, uh, that started June 20th, 1943, lasting about 36 hours, okay? And, and this is reported all across the country that the uh, uh, Mayor Jeffries and the governor called uh, President Roosevelt to send in the troops. They sent in 6,000 army troops and tanks armed with automatic weapons to, to uh, break up this uh, race riot. So with housing scarce or non-existent, non-existent, it was a blow to African Americans that they were only allowed to use one of the many public housing facilities in the city in 1941. That's uh, basically the, uh, the uh, Brewster Douglas projects. That's what a lot of us were going into when we look at the housing projects. There was rampant housing discrimination. You have a lot of us coming up from the South and um, we're being pushed into the uh, Black Bottom Paradise Valley areas. We're being discriminated from moving to other areas. We're paying two or three times as much for the rent as white people are paying for the same type of, uh, for the same type of dwellings, okay? So beyond that, blacks in the projects paid twice as much, okay, than in white bottom parks. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of African Americans lived in a relative squalor. So the Sojourner Truth Projects were opened in 1942 and were targeted by whites who felt blacks did not deserve the home. Because this was originally, that project was going to be for uh, white people to live in. They were, uh, they were building two uh, uh, projects for uh, white people who were moving up here and African Americans working in the Defense Department. This one was going to be for white people because it was in a white neighborhood, okay? It was in the uh, uh, Nevada, uh, Benelan, I think, I forgot how to pronounce it, um, area of Detroit, and that was a white neighborhood, all right? And what happened was, at the last minute, they couldn't find another location to build a black project. So then they let African Americans move into this one, they call it the Sojourner Truth Project, all right? So this is a, uh, so this is 1942. This is a picture here of an African American man, armed, black homeowner, protects his property and family from roving crowds near Sojourner, uh, Sojourner neighborhood. Because you had, because this is in a white neighborhood, 
You had white people intimidating us. There was an instance of a, a cross burning on African Americans' uh, uh, front lawn. You have all this taking place because they didn't want us living here. So we were armed. We weren't stupid. We're coming from the South. We know how white people are. So we were armed and we were protecting ourselves. All right? Now, even before the attack on Pearl Harbor, which took place December 7, 1941, the federal government was concerned about providing housing for the workers who were beginning to pour into the area. On June 4, 1941, now this is before the attack on Pearl Harbor, okay? So this is before the U.S. actually gets involved in fighting in World War II. They're already uh, providing uh, military equipment and things like that, producing military equipment. But this is before the attack on Pearl Harbor. So on June 4, 1941, the Detroit Housing Commission approved two sites for defense housing projects, one for whites, one for blacks. The site originally selected by the commission for black workers was in a predominantly black area, but the federal government chose a site at Nevada and Finlon streets, which was a white neighborhood, okay? So, now the Detroit, uh, now, before this takes place, 43, June 25, 1941, is Executive Order 8802, signed into law by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. What that did was that desegregated a lot of these jobs from the Defense Department, and these were a lot of the jobs that we got when we were moving up here from the South. The reason why that happened, because they mentioned Roosevelt, and so in, in, in many rivers across, Gate, Dr. Gates mentions Roosevelt opening up these jobs, right? Y'all heard that, right? He didn't tell you why Roosevelt opened up the jobs. It wasn't out of the kindness of his heart. It was because A. Philip Randolph, president of the Brotherhood Sleeping Car Porters, threatened to put 100,000 African Americans marching on Washington to embarrass uh, Roosevelt if he did not do this. That was because of pressure that was put on Roosevelt by A. Philip Randolph. That's why Executive Order 8802 was signed. That's why those Defense Department jobs opened up, all right? Britannica.com. Uh, official website of the Encyclopedia Britannica. They have a write up there about Executive Order 8802, that was June 25th, 1941. So that's pressure. That's, the A. Philip Randolph leveraged the power that he had with uh, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Force. He leveraged that to push an agenda. Now, the Detroit riot of 1943 lasted only about 24 hours. Now, many sources say about 36 hours. It, it, it lasted a, a, about a day and a half, so but a lot of sources I've seen say 36 hours. From 10.30 uh, p.m. on June 20th to 11 p.m. on June 21st. Uh, nonetheless, it was considered one of the worst riots during World War II era. Several contributing factors revolved around police brutality and the, the sudden influx of black migrants from the south into the city, lured by the promise of jobs in defense plants. Okay? A lot of, a lot of these movements of African Americans all centered around jobs. Also, many of us are being ran out of the south by white domestic terrorists. Okay, we're being ran off of our farms. We, we uh, uh, you know, uh, our farms are being set on fire, or we're being shot and killed, and then the other family members flee, and our farms are taken over by white people. This is all going on because when you study from uh, about 1865 to about 1920, 1865 Civil War, Civil War ends June 2nd, 1865. You have the 13th Amendment, December of 1865. From 1865 to 1920, we acquired. Some estimates show between 16 million to about 20 million acres of land. Yeah. Then from 1920 to 1975, we lose 14 million acres of land. And a lot of that is the white domestic terrorists. Okay? All right, so the migrants faced an acute housing shortage, which many thought would be reduced by the construction of public housing. However, the construction of public housing for blacks in predominantly white neighborhoods often created racial tension. And in 1943 alone, on page 200, of many rivers to cross. This is the actual book. That's the companion to the six-part documentary from, from that Gates put out. Okay, this is by uh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates and Donald uh, Yapoli. On page 200 of his book, he talks about how in 1943 alone there were 200, uh, 240 racial clashes all across the U.S. This is just in one year. Okay, now. The migrants facing acute housing shortage, which many thought would be reduced by the construction of public housing. However, the construction of public housing for blacks in a predominantly white neighborhood often created racial tension. So just ahead of the riot that starts June 20th, 1943, white defense plant workers protested the promotion of three black workers. 25,000 Packard plant employees walked off the job with one famously saying, I'd rather see Hitler and Hirohito win the uh, win, uh, win that work beside the N-word on the assembly line. 
So you got rampant racism going on in, in, inside the plants, the auto plants and the Department of Defense plants as well. Sick of poor treatment by whites, police, and others, blacks in the city began a bumping campaign, essentially bumping into whites on sidewalks and refusing to sidestep out of their way uh, on oncoming streets. On June 20th, 1943, at Belle Isle Park, the ride would begin just a couple of hours before midnight. Two young black men reportedly angered that they were put out of the local park days earlier, went to uh, Belle Isle to start a fight with a group of white men. Police, aware of the issues, searched the cars of black park visitors, but not the vehicles of white park visitors. So at 10 p.m., roughly 200 people began fighting, sparking off a series of rumors. Now, Leo Tipton and Charles Little Willie Lyons told a black crowd at the Forest Social Club that some white people had thrown a black woman and her baby off the Belle Isle Bridge. Okay? That was not true, though. The news spread that 500 blacks stormed the streets and damaged property. Conversely, whites were misled by rumors that blacks raped and killed a white woman at Belle Isle and a large number of armed white men took to the streets of revenge in the early morning. Okay? That's going into the morning of June 21st. Now, the whites attacked any black person they saw with some blacks returning from late night work shifts unaware of the dangerous situation. Police reportedly shot black riders. Police, police reportedly shot black riders in the back, considering them nothing more than looters, even though white riders were just as destructive, if not even more destructive. Eventually, Mayor Edward Jeffries, Jr. and Governor Harry Kelly asked President Theodore uh, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, for uh, military for, for uh, military assistance to uh, calm down the ride. That should be Franklin Roosevelt. That's 43. Now, this is an actual scene from the right, okay? This is from the Detroit News. Detroit News has a big article about this from 1999. A white mob moves up Woodward looking for trouble in the early hours of the 1943 riot. At least two overturned cars can be seen in the background, okay? This is, this is an actual scene from this riot, okay? There were thousands of people involved in this. So we talk about the 67 rebellion. The, the, the real one jumped off in 43 during World War II. So while you got brothers over in World War II fighting in other countries, you got this going on. There was a war going on right here in Detroit. A race war broke out. Now this is another scene. A white mob overturns a car belonging to a black man on Woodward. The whites running at right are chasing the driver somewhere over here. They, they're chasing the driver down. Now you're going to have uh, 34 people killed, 25 were African Americans, 9 were white. 17 of the 25 African Americans killed were killed by police. Now, the violence ended only after President Franklin Roosevelt, at the request of Detroit Mayor Edward Jeffries, ordered 6,000 federal troops into the city. 1,800 people were eventually arrested. Between 433 to 700 people were injured, because I saw 433 in one source, 700 in another source. 34 people were killed. Uh, the police claimed that these shootings were justified, the shootings of the African Americans. The police claimed the shootings were justified since the victims were engaged in looting stores on Hastings Street. Of the nine whites who died, none were killed by police. The city suffered an estimated $2 million in property damage also. All right, now, here is, uh, this is from page 200 and 201 of the African American Many Roads Across, the actual book. So they talk about uh, the Detroit race riot. There were, uh, there were, there was uh, more than 240 racial clashes in the U.S. in 1943 alone. This is going to lead to the white flight after World War II, after 1949, the Federal Housing Act of 1949, which allows white people to put 3% down on low interest loans, getting houses built out in the suburbs. This is what's going to lead to the suburbs to be built. This leads to the deindustrialization of the inner city. So while these suburbs are being built, the plants are being taken out of the inner city, put out in the suburbs. The expressways are being built because of the U.S. Interstate Highway Act of 1952 and 56. So white people can drive downtown in the inner city and back out to their new homes in the suburbs. But the expressways, 41,000 miles of interstate highways, are wiping out thousands of African American, African -American owned businesses and homes all across the country. Then just happened in Detroit. So this came at a time of heightened racial tensions across the country, caused in part by simmering, simmering black anger at white American hypocrisy. Uh, uh, whites and then U.S. waged uh, what the country officially portrayed as a righteous war in Europe against Hitler's hateful ideology. Virulent racism ran rampant and unchecked at home, okay? So this is why he talks about the black media, the, the black press, especially black newspapers, launched the Double V campaign. 
We were, we, we were fighting for victory abroad, okay, against Hitler, and victory at home against racism as well, the Double B campaign. Now here's some sources, some more, here's some sources where you can read uh, more information about the 1943 uh, race riot. Uh, the 1943 race riot, DetroitNews.com, uh, February 10th, 1999. Blackpass.org has a good write-up on this, Detroit race riot, 1943. News1.com from June 20th, uh, 2013. Detroit race riots began on this day in 1943. And um, Detroit Historical Society, their website, DetroitHistorical.org, race riot in 1943. They have an article... Um, it's, it just go to this website. Uh, it, it's, it's called Encyclopedia of Detroit, but the actual website is DetroitHistorical.org, and that's the uh, Detroit Historical Society's website. On that website, they have a section. It's called Encyclopedia of Detroit. All right, and then uh, this just deals with some background information: 43, 42 to 45 wartime production of military equipment in Detroit. Um, Racial tensions from 1945 to 1965 continue. Just in just in Detroit alone, you got about 200 racial clashes. Uh, just in Detroit alone, from 45 to 65, 1960 specifically, 1964, because of that U.S. Interstate Highway Act, I 75 and I 75 uh, come through Black Bottom and Paradise Valley as well. Okay, so that's just some background information. And also, what you're going to see is the hour. You're going to see the, the big three: General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. There are, are uh, building uh, new factories in the suburbs. They're building new factories in uh, Ohio, things like this. None are built in the inner city, okay, from 1947 to 1958. And none are built in Detroit. Now, these new factories that they're building are, are on what are called sprawling campuses. So instead of being the big multi-story uh, plants like the packing plant, these, these plants have more automation in them. This automation is going to eliminate a lot of the low-level jobs many of our great-grandparents and grandparents, things like that, got when they moved up here from Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee, okay? Uh, so, so this is going to de-employ a lot of African Americans, these new plants that are popular. In less than two decades, Detroit lost 128,000 auto industry jobs from 1947 to 1967. Also, there's a good article from InTheseTimes.com, InTheseTimes.com, called uh, Detroit's Downfall, The Myth of Black Misleadership. Detroit's Downfall, The Myth of Black Misleadership, because that article talks about how when Coleman Young took over Detroit as mayor, and this happened in other cities, that, that like that first wave of black mayors took over, those cities were already in trouble. They didn't become in trouble because of the black mayor. No, they were already in trouble. That's why they, that's one of the reasons why they were turned over. Then they get blamed for it. All right? Okay, so they talked about the uh, Montgomery bus boycott, right? Starts December 5th, 1955. Ends up lasting 381 days. What is the segregation on the buses in Montgomery, Alabama? I give you a hint. It wasn't the bus boycott. Anybody know? Anybody know what ended segregation on the buses? It was the, it was the lawsuit of Brother versus Gale filed February 1st, 1956. This is what actually ended segregation on the buses because this case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay? There were four plaintiffs. All right? Now, Rosa Parks was the one who sparked the Montgomery bus boycott. But these sisters were all, uh, all African American women who refused to give up their seats also. Many of them before, actually before Rosa Parks, all right? So, the lawsuit of Broward versus Gale was filed by uh, attorney Fred Gray and Charles D. Langford uh, on February 1st, 1956. Now, this is two days after segregation is bombed out the King's house, okay? And also in 1956, during the Montgomery bus boycott, Dr. King tried to get a concealed pistol license in Montgomery, Alabama, because Dr. King had guns in his home. He wasn't stupid. He was denied a concealed pistol license. Bayard Rustin finds out that Dr. King had his guns in his house because Bayard Rustin was over his house one day during the Montgomery bus boycott, and he goes and sits down on the sofa, almost sits on a loaded pistol, loaded gun. And Dr. King told him, don't be afraid, you know, it's a gun, I just have it here for protection. So they have a long conversation for hours over, look, you can't lead this nonviolent movement and have guns. What if somebody tries to break in your house and you shoot them to defend yourself? He said, that'll derail the movement. So eventually, Dr. King, even though he disagrees with them, Dr. King is going to get rid of his guns. However, Dr. King later 
after July 10, 1964, when the Deacons for Defense and Justice were formed in Jonesboro, Louisiana, to protect civil rights workers, Dr. King, at first, he's against using them, because they offered to uh, protect him and protect civil rights workers. At first, he's against it, but he's going he's to later use them. And core, Congress of Racial Equality, they were the organization that probably used the Deacons for Defense and Justice the most. They were used to protect the civil rights workers in the South from crazy white people trying to kill them. And because, and when you study why they were formed, they, the civil rights workers could not get the proper protection from the sheriffs and the police officers. Because many of them were working with the Klan. Okay? So when you study June 21st, 1964, the beginning of the freedom summer, when Goodman, Schwarner, and Cheney go missing, it, the, the, the sheriff was working with the Klan right. to tell them where they were. It was, they, were killed, they were killed by the Ku Klux Klan. All right? So the original plaintiffs in the case were really S. Browder, Susan McDonald, Claudette Coleman, and Mary Louise Smith and Jeanette Reese, but outside pressure convinced Jeanette Reese to withdraw from the case in February. So these were four African-American women who were the plaintiffs in this case that goes all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And what they're trying to do is test the constitutionality of segregation because people there in Montgomery and the attorneys and those with, with, with the NAACP like E.D. Nixon, they don't think that segregation is, it, uh, is legal based upon the U.S. Constitution and the year prior to that, May 17, 1954, that's when you had Brown versus that's when you had uh, Brown versus Board of Education. That U.S. Supreme Court case really helps to really kicks, helps to kick off the civil rights movement from a legal perspective. Okay, because prior to this bus boycott, you had one in 1953 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that was led by the Reverend T.J. Jemison. That that lasted eight days, cost the bus company sixteen hundred dollars. It wasn't nearly as successful as this one because that one was before Brown versus Board of Education. But Dr. King and others are going to contact Reverend T.J. Jemison to get advice from him on how to run this boycott. All right, so the list of defendants include the mayor, William A. Gale, who was the mayor of Montgomery, the city's chief, uh, chief of police, representatives from Montgomery's Board of Commissioners, Montgomery City Bus Lines, Inc., two bus drivers, and representatives of the Alabama Public Service Commission. They sued all these people. All right, and eventually it's going to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. It goes through an appeals process, and then on uh, December 20th, Dr. King and the Montgomery Improvement Association, which was the organization that was organized to lead the Montgomery bus boycott, and he is elected president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. Uh, they voted to end the 381-day Montgomery bus boycott after all the appeals, and it came down that it's unconstitutional for Montgomery to segregate the bus lines. That's what ended. It was this lawsuit. Abroad versus Gale. They had a three prong. They had a three prong strategy. They had the mass protest. They had the economic boycott, and they had a legal strategy also. Mm -hmm. All right. So very quickly here, this is Dr. Carter G. Whitson, uh, co-founder of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, founder of Black History Month. He's known as the Father of Black History Month, the Father of Black History. He's credited with laying the foundation for uh, Black History in uh, the Black Studies departments at colleges, HBCUs, things like this. He's born 10 years after slavery ends. Um, he goes on to uh, become the second African American to get a PhD from Harvard as well in 1912. Now, in 1915, 1915 is a pivotal time in the history of this country. 50th year anniversary of the Civil War ending and the 13th Amendment, uh, which uh, uh, legally ends chattel slavery. There's a three week uh, symposium at, in Chicago commemorating this 50th, 50th year anniversary. And they have all types of exhibits, all types of speeches and lectures dealing with the accomplishments and achievements of African Americans over this 50 year period of time. So it's at this symposium that he gets the idea to create an organization to scientifically study and document the history, accomplishments, and achievements uh, of African Americans in this country and on the continent of Africa and preserve them as well. So September 9th, 1915, he and four friends in Chicago, they formed the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which today is called SOLID, Association for the Study of African American Life and History. All right? And uh, 1916, he creates the uh, Journal of Negro History. And this was created because a lot of the um, white journals, historical journals, would not publish our historical papers. So he created this for us to do our own papers. All right? He goes on to be a professor at Howard University. 
And uh, you know, in 1915, the movie The Birth of a Nation comes out, which causes race riots in the streets. We're going to protest against the movie The Birth of a Nation, which rejuvenated the Ku Klux Klan. Most of the uh, roles of uh, African Americans were uh, white people in blackface. Read this article here, how black America <coughs> rallied to stop the racist film The Birth of a Nation. This is from March 1st, 2015 from TheRoot.com. We didn't just lay down a ticket. We led protests against the movie The Birth of a Nation in many cities where it was playing. Oscar Michaud was one of the and we're going to make movies also to put forth the images that we want to see as well, also to fight these stereotypical images. So Oscar Michaud was the most prolific uh, director, African-American director, producer of this era. African-Americans have been making our uh, own movies since the movie The Birth of a Nation in 1915. A lot of people don't know, we have 150 production companies, some completely owned by us, others partly owned by African Americans and others, that produced our own movies, so, so us doing our own movies today is not new. We own two theater chains that we show our movies in, the Lincoln Theater Chain and the Lafayette Theater Chain. Oscar Michaud is, most, is the most well-known director of this era from 1914 to 1948. He directed produced 44 movies. For more information on this, read Donald Bogle's huge book, Blacks in American Film and Television, an illustrated encyclopedia. It's actually an encyclopedia of all the movies and TV shows we were in up until 1988. Donald Bogle was in, I think it was episode four of Many Rivers to Cross. He's known as uh, the godfather of African American cinema. So with Dr. Uh, Carter G. Whitson, I'm going to wrap up in a couple minutes here. With Dr. Carter G. Whitson being an educator, he understood that our people did not understand their history. Our children largely did not understand their history as well as their parents. So in 1926, he creates, second week of 19, uh, February 1926, he creates Negro History Week, which is a cultural celebration. It was never designed to be the only time of the year we study our history, okay? He felt that African-American school children should uh, use that period of time, that one week, to show what they have to study year-round. He said it didn't make sense to teach uh, white history 51 months out of the year, 51 weeks out of the year, and just teach our history one week out of the year. Okay? It's supposed to be a celebration to look uh, past our accomplishments and achievements and to look forward as well to, to the future. If we just, and now each year there's a, a theme for African American History Month. Okay? So you don't have to, uh, so it makes it, 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 the theme is usually tied into what's going on at that period of time. So it's relevant to people also. So here are just a few of the previous things, because I've gone and looked at all of them going back to 1928. And a lot of these things tie into African history and culture. 1928, Civilization of World Achievement. 1933, Ethiopia Meets Era and Truth. 1935, The Negro Achievements in Africa. 1936, African Background Outline. 1960, Strengthening America Through Education in Negro History and African Culture. 1971, African Civilization and Culture, A Worthy Historical Background. For more information, for resources that you use for classrooms, homeschooling, things like this, Go to asala.org, A-S-A-L-H.org, asala.org, and they also have information on this year's theme dealing with black migrations and understanding the history of movements of African Americans, not just the transatlantic slave trade, but also the great migration, the impact that it's had on this country, the Marcus Garvey movement, the Red Summer of 1919 after World War I ends. They have all type of information there Dealing, uh, dealing with this, and they have tools that you can use in your classroom, at home, to teach this to our children also, okay? So with that, I'm gonna wrap up. I know uh, time is getting away from us. I'm gonna wrap up with that. I'll cut it short, and then I don't know if we have time for questions and answers. Uh, everybody got a pamphlet that came around, right? Yeah. Okay, so that has uh, uh, my DVDs on it. These are all some of my lectures over here. Please support us. This helps to finance the African History Network, helps to finance the research the radio show, etc. It helps us pay the bills, stay on the air, everything. Okay? All right, so with that, I want to say thanks for your attention. Uh, my hotel is Santi Sana, and uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Did y'all learn anything? Yes. Okay. You All right. For, you got time for one question. Go ahead. What, in your opinion, is... So you won't ask me one question. All right, nobody. All right, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. It's what, all right. What, what is your opinion of our biggest enemy today? If we were to be able to, to cultivate that kind of unity, where we had all our factions working together, our mm -hmm. ministers praying, and our activists uh, uh, protesting, our legal people right. filing lawsuits. Right. Because that's what was going on back then. Right, right. Well, well, well contrary to popular, just, okay, so 
contrary to popular belief, everybody was not involved. All black people were not involved in the civil rights movement, just so we understand. So, so even though there was some unity, everybody went unified. Now. I'm just keeping it real. Everybody went unified back then. Okay, you had you because you had some preachers who were undermining. You had preachers who hated Dr. King. You had preachers who were against the civil rights movement. Okay, so just so we understand, yes, we many of us were working together, but yeah, you had you know, preachers didn't want him in cell. Well, they didn't want him in cell. A lot, a lot of them didn't want him anywhere because they said he was rocking the boat. They said they said that wait a second, you know things just gonna get better for us. Okay, they looked at it. A lot of them looked at him as a troublemaker. A lot of black people today who praised Dr. King thought he was a troublemaker back then. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So, the, uh, the, the biggest thing is, one, we've been stripped of our history and culture. Our history and culture gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. I think I have the yeah. display here. It gives us our values and interests and our principles. It influences our economic empowerment and our political empowerment. Our VIPs, Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor James Small teachers, two of my teachers. Our, our biggest enemy is that we really fear how powerful we actually are. Because if we show up and start showing how powerful we are, then we're expected to do it every time. Okay? This is our, this is our biggest fear. So you have people saying your vote doesn't matter. Our vote, Republicans fear our vote more than we value our vote. This is why in 2016 there was a rampant voter suppression effort. 14 new states have voter ID laws. 868 fewer polling places all across the country. We don't understand how that was precipitated by Shelby County versus Holder, U.S. Supreme Court case in 2013, which struck down Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, because we don't understand the Voting Rights Act. <laughs> so all this comes from us not knowing what, what happens when you don't know that you don't know. What happens when your history and culture have been stripped away from you, and you believe that you don't have power, and the people telling you that you don't have power, many of them look like you, are designed so they can maintain a platform. Gatekeepers. They get, well, they ain't just gatekeepers. They're just ignorant. Because, because, for instance, I, every city I, I, I lecture in, I ask this question, nobody can answer. In 2016, how many African Americans were registered to vote in the 2016 election? Who knows? 16.4 million. What percentage voted? 59.6%. 7% point drop from 2012 when, 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 when it set a record. And that scared Republicans to death. When 66.6% .6 of African Americans registered to vote voted. But we didn't see the backlash coming because we don't understand how to connect one election to the other one. We vote transactionally. We don't understand the concept of what I call political self-defense and understand how to protect your gains. To be able to protect your gains, you have to have assessed your gains and understand the backlash is coming. 2013 Supreme Court case of Shelby County versus Holder was revenge for so many African Americans showing up to vote. We didn't see that. So in 2016, even though President Obama was not on the ballot, his policies were. There have been over 100 policy reversals that Trump has implemented reversing President Obama's policies. Okay? So there were 4 million voters in 2016 that voted for President Obama in 2012 that did not vote for President in 2016. One third were African Americans. Trump won the three battleground states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania by uh, 78,000 votes. 78,000 votes. If black people in just Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania voted at the same level in 2016 that we did in 2012, he would not be president right now. But we still don't understand that. Because we keep thinking we don't have power, and we keep listening to people who tell us we don't have power. But that's designed so they maintain their platform. Okay? All right. So, with that, and uh, Pew Research has the research dealing with this. PewResearch.org. Pew they have a research documenting this. And they talk about uh, the black vote being suppressed. Now, there were reasons why it's suppressed. I understand that. But I was doing national radio, national syndicated radio, five days a week during the 2016 election. I told people, I, I'm looking at the vote suppression taking place. I'm looking at the lawsuits Democrats are filing against Republicans. And I said, we're going to have to have a record number of what's coming out and vote. I said, this ain't the time to stay at home. I told people that. I said, if you want to vote third party, I said, that's a vote for Trump. People ain't listen to me. Whoop, there it is. That's what happened. We invented math, but we don't understand math. I said, if you understand math, you can see what's taking place. We, we still don't understand it. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up with that. I know time is short, but thanks for your attention. Hopefully that answers your question. Did it answer your question? Uh, that, that did answer <laughs> And I'm just going to ask that I hope sometimes during this Black History Month, mm -hmm. I heard your uh, 
your uh, lecture on the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. it, was that the one uh, Richard Nixon won on drugs? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I hope you do that at some point. Okay, Especially maybe next time we'll talk about that. Our children. Well, yeah, because the, 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 the mass incarceration didn't start in 94 with the crime bill. It goes back to June 17, 1971, when Richard Nixon declared his war on drugs. We don't understand that. We think it was the 94 crime bill that started that. No, that goes back to 71 with Nixon, who ran on the platform of law and order, by the way, which was part of the same platform that Trump ran on, law and order. That's where he got it from. All right, so we'll wrap it up with that. And